I had a more fortunate childhood than most. I grew up in a house that was quite large in size, surrounded by wineries and mountains. On the outside, the house was aged but serene, a historic gem tucked neatly in between a vast forest and acres of aromatic grapes. I distinctly remember when I would play in the backyard, how the aroma of grapes would surround me like a heavenly embrace. I miss that smell. However, I do not miss that house. The home was built in the late 1800s. The outside had weathered well over the years, but the inside needed constant repair. I remember how my mother would get frustrated every few months over something breaking, whether it be the stove not working, the pipes needing mending, or floorboards creaking. It seemed like a pit hole of endless restorations. Due to the house's age, at first, we easily brushed things off as the house settling. There would be knocks, creaks, bangs, you name it. My parents would say, this is just an old house. It's just settling. No need to fret. Like an obedient child, I believe them. At first. Then, the disembodied voices began. First in the cellar, when I was fetching a bottle of wine for my parents. My mom was making dinner, and my father was changing out of his work clothes. My mom had turned to me, soup ladle in hand, and said, Johnny, can you fetch mommy a bottle of rose label wine? I glanced at her, then at the cellar door. I hated the cellar. It just emitted the creepiest of vibes. I mean, truly, what little kid enjoys going down in a dark, half-finished basement anyways? None that I can think of. Knowing that her question was more of a statement than a question, I nodded hesitantly and made my way to the cellar door. The steps creaked under my feet as my eyes searched the pitch black for the light. It was one of those pull string lights, and of course, it resided at the bottom of the stairs, which was completely unhelpful. As I neared the bottom of the stairs, I heard shuffling, like you would hear if you were dragging something across the concrete floor. I stopped in place and listened, my heart beating faster with every passing second. I heard nothing more. I shrugged to myself and begged myself to believe it must have just been my footsteps on the stairs. I continued to the light. Once I lifted my hand to wave it into the darkness to find the string to the light, I froze. Disembodied voices were coming from my right. The only thing to my right, however was a furnace and an entry to a small room no one used. I could not make out what any of the whispers were saying, but I knew they were indeed voices. Were they the voices of the dead? I trembled, turned on my feet, and started running up the stairs, praying to God I would not fall and break my neck. I burst out of the cellar door breathless, and my mom, still stirring dinner, looked up from the pot, surprised. Johnny! Why are you running around in the cellar? You are causing such a racket, she scolded me, waving her ladle in the air before she went back to stirring. Did you fetch the bottle? I was not going back down there, so I lied. The bulb is burnt out, and I can't find my way around. Just as the words came out of my mouth, my father came sauntering in the room. I'll have a look at it, honey. He leaned over and pecked her cheek and gave me a stern look, as if punishing me with his eyes for my silliness of the dark. He pushed past me and headed for the cellar. I turned my body and followed him with my eyes, until he disappeared through the threshold. My mind was frantic with thoughts, mostly worried my dad would not return. After a minute, my father reappeared with a bottle in hand and handed it to my mother. What was wrong with the light? My mom asked. My father shot me a distasteful look, then softened himself as he turned to my mother. Nothing, honey. It just must have been too hard for Johnny to pull. I eyed my feet in embarrassment and retreated to my room until dinner was ready. I did not like being in the house by myself. If I would come home from school on any day and no one was home, I would wait in the front yard until someone else arrived home. Why was this, you ask? Obviously, it was not just because of a silly cellar incident. No, no. Many more incidents happened throughout the years. I cannot even count them all let alone recollect them all. I was terrified to be home alone because something was in that house. 
Probably multiple somethings, rather. One liked my sister's room. Who knows, maybe at one point it was their room. No one knows for sure. Getting back to my story, I will tell you about what I saw one day while waiting outside after school. As I'd mentioned, I refused to wait inside until someone else was home. My gut just told me not to risk it. I was walking back and forth, pacing the long dirt driveway, and I felt like something was watching me. My first thought was probably the trees, maybe a bird. I searched the tree line, then scanned up the trunks to the branches. There were so many trees that I shrugged it off and continued kicking dirt on the driveway, patiently passing the time. Overwhelmed with another wave of uneasiness, I again looked around me. It felt like whatever it was, it was boring holes in me with its eyes, and I shuddered at the thought. I turned to face the front of the house and combed the windows with my gaze. My eye fell upon my sister's window and the slightly parted blinds. I blinked multiple times and squinted at the window. Was I really seeing this? Did she have something propped against her window that may have laid against the blinds, causing them to part like that? I thought long and hard and shook my head at my own inner question. Her bed was next to the window. There would be nothing but the sight of it against that wall. My eyes grew wider and I continued to stare up at the window in shock. I watched on as the blinds slowly retreated and fell back into place. I gulped. Just at that moment, my sister bumped into me. Last one to the house is a rotten egg. She giggled and sprinted towards the front door. I was the competitive type, but not that day. That day, I would let her win. I was not going inside that house until my parents got home. However long that took, I would wait. As I have made you aware, this house of haunts has many stories and evil memories. There is one last one I feel I should share that will help you understand why I say something resided in my sister's room. Sure, the window event was creepy in itself, but this one, this one takes the cake. First of all, there was the feeling. Whenever I went into my sister's room, I was just overwhelmed by a feeling of invading as if it was silently telling me to get out. I brushed it off, of course, because at that time, we hadn't lived there long, and I just assumed it was the age of the house leaving me unsettled. Then one evening, I was in my sister's room, watching television with her while our mom made dinner. As I have explained, her bed is against the wall with the window. Well, her dresser was perched over by her bedroom door near the hallway, we were laughing at a silly kid's show. The sun was going down outside, but the room was still quite lit with daylight, enough so that I was able to get over the creepy feeling I would get being in her room. As a commercial break came on, I got up to go to the bathroom. As I stood, everything atop her dresser, a hairbrush, a few articles of clothing, and her makeup bag fell off onto the floor. Unable to take a step forward, I glanced over my shoulder at my sister to see if she had seen that happen as well. The look on her face was priceless. Her mouth was agape in a way I'd never seen. Her eyes beamed as wide as they would go, and she was nibbling at her bottom lip. She brought her wide eyes from the dresser and met mine. Yes, indeed, she had seen it too. Now sometimes in this house, I was scared, and sometimes I liked to tease whatever it was just to see what it would do. So, on my way to the bathroom, before I exited her room, I asked it to put everything back the way it was before I came back. My sister rushed to my side, refusing to be alone in the room, and waited outside the bathroom for me to finish. Once we were back in her room, everything that had been brushed off on her floor was back atop her dresser. Now that was some trick. It took my sister nearly a week to agree to sleep in her room again after that one. My room was on the opposite side of the wall to my sister's. I would hear scratching noises in the middle of the night, like there was possibly a rat in the wall. I'd chalk it up to just that, because the house was historically old, and as I mentioned, needing constant repairs. One evening, the scratching was so loud I thought something was going to break through the wall at any moment. I was tossing and turning in bed, even tried a pillow over my head to muffle the noise to no avail. 
Defeated, I went to her room to investigate the noise. I wondered how she could sleep through it. As I entered her dark room, the noise halted. I held my breath, and the feeling of not being wanted was the heaviest it had ever been. It was as if, in my mind's eye, I could see it glaring at me through the darkness of the room, daring me to take one more step forward. I stood there in a panic. I was not going to walk any further in the room, but I did not feel safe turning my back to the darkness to walk out of it either. With a quivering whisper, I spoke to the darkness. I'm just going back to bed. I'll leave you alone. As I began to turn around, something quite solid knocked into my legs and took me down. My legs buckled and I landed with a crumpled thud on her floor. My first reaction was to search the darkness for what had knocked me off my feet. I thought ghosts were opaque. How could they hit you with such a solid force? I have never answered that question, but something had, in fact, hit me so hard it took me down. I remained on the floor for a good few minutes, wondering if my sister had woken from the noise. But eventually, her soft snores permeated the blackness, and I knew somehow she slept right through it. After finally gaining my wits, I climbed to my feet ever so slowly. This time, I was going to walk backwards towards the hallway until I was fully out of her room, then beeline it for my room. That was the plan anyway, until the scratching noise resumed right next to where I stood. Then all my planning went to the wind, and my feet took flight. I ran so fast out of her room, I almost couldn't stop before I hit the wall. I turned and ran in my room and shut the door and locked it. The scratching noise continued all night, unlike other nights when it would come and go. But I will tell you one thing. I never investigated the sound again after that night. I had my mom buy me some earplugs, and I started using them on a nightly basis. Did I ever see anything in the house? Many times. Mostly out of the corner of my eye. But the experiences seemed to be creepier, not knowing exactly what or who was causing it. We lived in that house for 15 years. My sister and I dubbed it the House of Horrors. I'm still not quite sure what was causing the activity, but the house had been built over battlefields. That much, I know. <laughs> After a year of dating, I asked my girlfriend to move in. I must note that up until she moved in, nothing notable had ever happened in my apartment. But once she did, whatever it was definitely let us know that it did not approve. A few days after she moved in, we were having breakfast at the counter. I was getting ready for work and she was getting ready for school. She worked as a teacher's aide until she graduated. Talking amongst ourselves, we watched as the orange juice bottle suddenly wobbled on the counter. That was the beginning. Over the next month, both of our laptops suddenly died. They wouldn't even turn on. I took them to a computer repair shop, and they couldn't fix them either. It was highly frustrating. Then the television in the living room stopped working, so I had to borrow one from my mom. Then my cell phone battery was draining excessively. I would charge it all night and it would be at 100%. But if I stayed home, my battery would be dead in an hour. If I went to work, my battery lasted until I got home. I thought that was really odd. I was in the living room watching my borrowed TV while my girlfriend graded papers for class in the bedroom. After about an hour, she peeked her head out and told me she was taking a break to take a bath. Apparently, while I was watching television, a black mass formed by the door in the bathroom hovered near the sink for a minute or two and then just disappeared. She ran out of the bathroom half wrapped in a towel and really shaken. I was able to get her calmed down and stayed in the room with her while she got some pajamas on. She decided to bring the papers with her out to the living room to finish grading while I watched TV. As she shuffled them together and started to grade, she gasped loudly. I paused the TV and looked over at her, slightly annoyed. 
Holding the papers up for me to see, she pointed at the B+. I nodded and said, Okay, and? Her eyes widened. Look at the plus. I leaned over and looked at it. That's a plus, all right. I said, trying to joke around. She was getting a little miffed. Look closer at the horizontal line. I rolled my eyes and squinted in the terrible lighting. I wasn't sure what I was even looking for. Isn't a plus a plus? I wrote a B minus on there. Something changed it to a plus. The line is jagged and wobbly. She thrust the papers even closer to my face. Look. Frustrated, I turned the table lamp next to me on, grabbed the papers from her hand, and looked closer. I could tell what she meant. The line was weirdly etched on there. You could tell the pressure she used to write the B plus was not the same pressure used to make the horizontal line. I will admit it was strange. Fortunately, after a few more months, the activity seemed to die down quite a bit. Only a few odd noises here and there remain. No more masses have been seen or any other objects moving or writing on their own. I honestly don't know what made the difference. Maybe if something was in my apartment, it just took a little while to warm up to my girlfriend, and now they're okay with her being there. Hired to do a remodel for a recently purchased home, I was working in the kitchen, starting to pull up the flooring. It was about lunchtime, and I was thinking about stopping to take a break. At the front door, there were three loud bangs that almost sounded like heavy knocks. So I put my tools down and went to see who was at the door. No one was there. Obviously, I thought it odd, but figured that maybe it was some kids playing a prank, knowing the house was under construction. After all, the home was a perfect target for a trick. A few afternoons later, I was in the guest bathroom laying some tile. I heard what sounded like creaking boards from the kitchen as if someone was walking around in there. Unsure what the noise could possibly be, because the front door did not open, I went to investigate. No one was in the kitchen, so I proceeded to check the entire house, room by room. I came up empty-handed. There was no one in the house but me. I brushed it off and went back to laying tile. The next morning, I was laying new backsplash in the kitchen. Then I heard a splashy noise coming from the guest bathroom. I stopped what I was doing and listened closely for a few moments. It sounded as if the sink was on. At this point, I was swearing under my breath because something was in this dang house and it would not let me finish a job to save my life. I was getting pissed. I turned off the faucet and decided to leave my cell phone in the bathroom to record to see what I could capture. Once I was finished with the backsplash, I went to collect my phone and inspect it to see if I caught anything. Then I saw what looked like a black mass shadow figure form on the wall and waver for a few minutes before gliding towards the door frame and then just dissipating entirely. To be honest, I was not shocked. After the last couple of days, I highly suspected that something was in there with me. Fortunately, I only had one more day of work before I was finally finished with what I was contracted for. I finally got to leave that house and that paranormal mass for good. My mom works as a nurse in a hospital. They have rooms for them to stay in while working extended shifts in case they don't want to go home so they can get as much rest as possible. Each room is shared by two employees. My mom had one of her friends that was also a nurse as a roommate. My mother was just coming off a long shift and decided that she would stay the night at the hospital because she had to return in eight hours to start her next shift. As she worked her shift the night before, she noticed that she was feeling worse and worse. She had a fever and was even more tired than she usually would have been after work. 
This is one of the reasons why she also decided to stay the night at the hospital. She informed some of the doctors and nurses that she wasn't feeling well and what her symptoms were before retiring to her room. She did her nightly prayers since she is someone who, no matter how sick or busy, will find time to speak to God. Shortly after her prayers, she climbed into bed and fell asleep. Her roommate was working the overnight shift, so my mom was alone in the room and shouldn't have been disturbed all night. Sometime around 1 a.m., my mom woke up to the sound of knocking on the door. Figuring one of her colleagues was there to check on her, she went to the door to see who was there. It was unusual for someone to do this, but since she had told people that she was sick, it wasn't impossible. But why they wouldn't have just let her get her rest seemed odd. When she opened the door, no one was on the other side. She looked up and down the hall, but no one seemed near enough to have accidentally bumped up against it. She shook her head and went back into the room and went back to sleep. She wasn't asleep for more than another 30 minutes when she heard her door open to the room. She never leaves the door unlocked when she is there, but in her delirium of being sick and having been woken up at such a late hour, she figured it was possible that she left the door open. When she looked up, she saw a man in a white coat walking towards her. He had a stethoscope around his neck, so she figured that it was a doctor that was coming to check on her, since she had told people that she didn't feel well. She looked up to his face to see who it was, but it was blurry, and she couldn't make out any distinguishing features. As he got closer to her, she noticed his face began to shift from person to person. But she recognized these people. They were people that she was close to in her life. Her family, friends and the people she worked with. She said that it also felt like the closer the doctor got, the room's temperature seemed to drop lower and lower. By the time he was right next to her, she was freezing. She tried to move off the bed, but it was like she was paralyzed in place. After seeing the face change on this thing that was in her room, she tried to call out, but no sound would escape her lips. The doctor's face seemed to shift a final time into that of a handsome man, and he began to examine her. His hands were like ice as he examined her. When he placed one of his hands on her neck, seeming to check her pulse there, the cold became almost unbearable as the hand lingered. Then he brought his other hand up to her neck, and she felt pressure build like he was trying to choke her. She struggled to take in a full breath as whatever this was continued to squeeze harder and harder. The faces started to shift again to the faces of those she cared about the most, making it seem like these were the people that were trying to kill her. As her vision began to fade, she remembered that she had a necklace with a cross on it next to her bed. She forced her arm to move and started digging through the front pocket, trying to feel for the thin gold chain. Finally, she felt the familiar strand of metal and pulled it out. The creature, or whatever it was, screamed out in pain and began thrashing about like it had been burned. It took a few more steps back and then seemed to collapse in on itself. The cold in the room seemed to dissipate, and the paralysis slowly abated. When she felt strong enough to get up without falling, she left her room and went next door, to where she knew one of her friends was staying the night as well. Needless to say, when she knocked on their door around 2 a.m., she was a little annoyed at being woken up, but when she saw my mom's face, it was obvious something was wrong. She told her everything. She listened without comment until my mom finished. After that, her friend told her that she experienced some strange things herself, both in the room and around the hospital, like lights going on and off on their own, scratching and knocking noises and sounds coming from empty rooms. These were things my mom had never heard from anyone else in the hospital. She felt lucky that she had her rosary so nearby when the thing attacked her in her room. The next morning, my mom came home after asking to be relieved for her morning shift. She was too rattled from the encounter the night before and was still feeling sick. When she got home, I was surprised to see her home so early and asked if she was okay. She tried to pass it off like everything was alright, but I knew something was wrong and pressed her further. She finally told me what happened the night before. I was scared for her. I can only imagine what it would have been like to go through it herself. She now won't go to the hospital without her rosary. And me? I will go to another hospital. Any hospital before the one my mom works at.
Although my sister was younger than me by a few years growing up, we always were best friends. We shared toys, played games with one another, and even shared a bedroom. When I was 11 and Christy was 8, we were alone in our bedroom playing I Spy with one another. As our parents had gone out for the evening and we had been left with a babysitter for the evening, we had gone back and forth for a while, searching out things in our bedroom, trying to fool one another. We heard our babysitter call out to us from downstairs. It was time for bed. Not wanting to incur the ire of the girl downstairs, we turned out the lights and climbed into bed. Christy didn't want to stop playing, so when I closed my eyes, trying to go to sleep, she called out, I spy something with my eye, something that starts with D. I heard a muffled thud from across the room. One of our rag dolls that were made by our grandmother had fallen onto the floor. I didn't know how the doll could have fallen. There wasn't a fan in the room, and the window was closed, so it couldn't have been the wind. How did the dolly fall? I asked Christy. Neither one of us were over there. She gave me a shrug, and I continued to look around the room for what my sister might have chosen. Then I had an idea. Dolly, you see a dolly, I told her. Suddenly she screamed out, kicking the covers off of her. She was scared that much I could tell. But the sudden shift in the mood caught me off balance, and I didn't know what to say or do for a moment. Christy, what's the matter? I asked her, now sitting up in bed. Something grabbed me, she insisted. What do you mean something grabbed you? I'm the only one here beside you, I told her. I walked over to her bed to check on her, thinking that it was just her imagination. I picked up the covers and looked around, and she huddled against the wall, watching my every move. I even went so far as pulling her blankets off the bed. But that's all I found, blankets. You see, there's nothing there. I reassured her. Now go back to bed. She seemed to be calmer now, and slowly inching forward, allowing me to cover her back up with blankets. I swear something grabbed me, I'm not making it up, she said, sounding a little unsure of herself. I tucked her back into bed and handed her back her bear, hoping it would help her not be scared. Her eyes looked big as she stared at me, I'm sure, trying to find out if I believed her or not. I climbed back into my own bed and pulled the covers over myself, ready to go to sleep. A light rustling noise came from the foot of my bed. I tried to ignore it, but it continued on and seemed to become more persistent. I slowly crawled across the top of my bed and looked down onto the ground, but nothing was there, just bare floor. I figured that Christy, thinking something had grabbed her now, had me hearing things that weren't there. I got under my blankets, hoping this would be the last time I had to try to go to sleep that night. I had just laid my head back on the pillow when I heard the rustling noise again. But not only do I hear it, I see a small lump moving under the blankets on my bed. I don't know why, but I sat there, transfixed by what I saw as it inched closer and closer to my legs. Then when it was almost next to me, it burst forward and I felt something latch onto me. Screaming, I kicked out, but whatever had hold of me wouldn't let go. I managed to push the blankets down far enough I could see strands of bright red yarn peeking out from the darkness. I pulled my leg out from the blankets, and the rag doll that had fallen earlier was holding onto my foot. I screamed again kicking frantically, trying to get the doll to let go. Its eyes seemed to bore into mine as panic took over. At some point, Christy had gotten out of bed and was next to me and grabbed hold of the doll. As soon as she touched it, the arms went limp and she threw it down on the floor. We stared at it for a few seconds. I almost expected it to get up and chase after me. I told you something grabbed me, Christy said, almost as an afterthought. Uh Uh-huh. I said, not wanting to take my eyes off the doll. I couldn't believe what had just happened. The doll, it had been, alive. Our bedroom door opened, and our babysitter sat there looking at the two of us, out of bed. I thought I told you two it was time for bed, she said. Do you want me to tell your parents you were up late? And what is it with all this yelling? No. No, we both said in unison. I considered telling her about what had happened, 
but I knew she wouldn't believe me. I shot a look at Christy, and she seemed to have the same idea. I picked up the doll and put it in one of the drawers in the desk in our room, hoping it would contain it for the night. Not wanting to press my luck with the babysitter further, I got back into bed. Now go to sleep, you too. It's late, she told us and closed the door. Nothing happened the rest of that night, and eventually both of us fell asleep. I woke up first thing the next morning and shook Christy so we could figure out what we would do with the doll. I opened the desk drawer to find the doll, but it was empty. Figuring it had to be somewhere in the room, since the door was shut, we tore our room apart trying to find it, but in the end, we couldn't locate the doll anywhere. Later on in the afternoon, we were outside playing with our friend Amanda, who told us that she had found a rag doll in her room that morning that she had never seen before. We asked her to bring it out so we could see it, and I didn't know what to say when I saw that it was our doll.